Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. I hope you're having a fantastic day. I just woke up from a nap because, well, whenever you have two young children, you sleep whenever you can. Today, because I know a lot of you are stuck at home, and I do know that a lot of you have been playing online cash games recently, today we have the topic of five tips to crush online cash games because, like I said, that is what we are all going to be forced to play for perhaps the foreseeable future. All right, so it is worth mentioning that online cash games are a great way to become a strong poker player. And that's because online cash games are usually tougher than live games, and you play way more hands per hour when you're playing online. So you get to play more hands, and you're playing against tougher, tougher competition. And those two things alone make online poker great, great practice for live poker, especially if you ever have any aspirations whatsoever to play at the medium or high stakes. Um, it is worth mentioning that the average four tabling online cash game player can play roughly 400 hands per hour, which, you know, if you try to do that in live poker, it'll take you 13 hours to put in that same amount of volume. So one hour online equals 13 hours live. And I mean, it doesn't exactly translate to that because obviously when you're playing four tables at a time, you're not really focusing on every single hand, but this really is one of the main reasons why online players are way better than live players. They just get to play way, way, way more hands. And also, the bad players online lose at a much faster rate in terms of big blinds per hour because, well, they're also playing more hands, right? So if they're losing, let's say, three big blinds per hundred hands, if they're playing live poker, that you know will take them quite a while to lose a bunch of money, whereas online, they lose it very, very quickly. So what ends up happening is that if you want to beat online cash games and you know really any high stakes game to some extent, you must learn to play a fundamentally sound strategy. It is mandatory. So tip number one is to just generally play aggressively before the flop. So let's take a look at a few spots here. So here we have cutoff versus the low jack when they raise. So low jack raises, we're in the cutoff. The low jack is middle position. Cutoff is the position to the right of the um, button. So in this situation, low jack raises, and we're in the cutoff. What a lot of people will do in a lot of games is they will flat call a lot. They'll call in this scenario, and then they will try to see the flop and go from there. But in reality, the right play is to three bet with every single hand in your range. So these, that, that's what you want to be doing in this scenario. You want to be three betting a large portion of the time, perhaps with your entire playable range. As we see here, right? This is really quite snug. A lot of people think they're supposed to be calling with all sorts of junk, but you're just not. And really, the only spots you're supposed to have much of a calling range when you're playing in a game that has rake is uh, when you're exactly on the button. So like right here, you see button versus low jack. In that scenario, you can have a flatting range, right? Um, it is worth mentioning most games online are played six-handed. If you're playing uh, nine-handed, if under the gun raises, then you could certainly have a flatting range like under the gun plus one with your pretty good hands. But for the most part, in a six-handed game, when you're playing, the only position you really want to have much of a flat calling range with is from the button and from the big blind. So we see here the hands that are getting flat called are, you know, the traditional flat call hands. Uh, middle pairs, big suited cards, low suited connectors. You may say, why are 9-8 suited and 8-7 suited not played? Well, turns out they're actually slightly dominated by the opponent's opening range to the point that they're just barely not playable. And all these hands are, like, all the hands on the cusp are just barely profitable. It's not like they're insanely profitable by any means. Um, here we have small blind versus low jack. So here we had cutoff versus low jack, button versus low jack, small blind versus low jack. And um, right here you see small blind, again, just three betting everything. Is ace jack on the button a three bet bluff? No, ace jack offsuit is a fold. You see ace jack offsuit here is folding. Are we not set mining? No. Again, we are playing in tough online games. I see a lot of you talking about the rake. These charts are solved using Munker Solver, solved with 5% rake up to 0.6 big blinds, which you know may actually be smaller than what you're playing, um, versus a 2.5 big blind raise, right? So if your opponents are playing with a larger raise size, 
right? Say they're raising bigger, then you should actually defend even tighter, right? What if your opponent's raising with a wide range? Well, then obviously you loosen up, right? I mean, come on. There are some adjustment, adjustments that you all should know how to make at this point in time, right? If your opponent's raised to seven big blinds preflop, play tighter. If your opponent's raised to two big blinds preflop, re- defend more often, play more hands. What stakes would you say this applies to? Literally all stakes. This is fundamentally sound poker. That's what we're talking about here today. We're discussing how to develop fundamentally sound poker, and this is a strategy you need to start implementing. So are we saying we don't have a flat calling range against a raise in the cutoff? Correct. You should literally three better fold every hand you're going to play when you're playing tough opponents who are in a raked environment, which you are, right? So if you're asking about um, various poker sites, I mean, I have a video where I went through many of them with my lawyer, Mac Verstandig, just the other day on uh, YouTube. Check that out. Um, are play money games good for practice? Um, not really. No, I would definitely tell you to play for some sort of real stakes. Even at the micro stakes games, are the players generally competent? They're certainly way more competent online than they are live. If you go to a one, two live no limit game, your opponents are going to be weak, loose, and passive. If you play a lot, I'm sorry, live, they're going to be weak, loose, and passive. Online, even at the tiniest stakes, they're going to be at least somewhat reasonable. How do you adjust if your opponent's playing way too many hands? Then you play more hands yourself. So all of this applies to literally all stakes, everyone. This is how you play fundamentally sound. Again, if you, as you're playing smaller stakes, you're going to find people who play worse, in which case that allows you to adjust more. All right. So tip number one is just generally play more aggressively. Stop flat calling. What about the earlier positions? All these charts either are available or will be available soon at pokercoaching.com in the tool section. Actually, these are there. We have six max online charts available in the tool section. All of these charts are there for all the positions. That's just included in the site. And, um, well, I have a special gift for all of you at the end, so stick around, and uh, you'll actually have access to all of that today. All right, so tip number two. Stop defending your big blinds so often. So in tournaments, very often, what you're supposed to do is defend your big blind incredibly often. And the reason is because there's no rake, and also because you're very often facing a min-raise, right? So... That allows you to play a wider range. No rake means there's more money in the pot, means you're just basically getting better odds. When I say no rake, I mean there's no rake in any individual pot, right? You pay the rake at the beginning of the tournament. You don't pay the rake in the middle of the hand. So there's no rake in the hands, and also you're usually facing smaller raises. And on top of that, there's also an ante in the pot. So there's even more money in the pot. So that allows you to play way wider ranges in tournaments. And a lot of people study tournaments and then go to play cash games and start trying to play equally wide of ranges, right? So that's a big mistake. So out of positions, especially when you're playing deep stacked, that's going to result in the big blind realizing their equity quite poorly. So let's say the low jack raises. Again, that's um, under the gun six-handed. Um, some of you are asking about nine-handed poker. Um, you basically don't play nine-handed online because the games don't exist or they minimally exist. Um, it, and really the only difference in between nine handed and six handed is just pre- pretend like the first three players have folded, right? The low jack is always the low jack. What do we mean by the low jack? Okay. At a poker table, I'll show you right real quick. We're going to play a poker hand. We have the big blind, the small blind, the button, the cutoff, the hijack, and the low jack. Under the gun six handed is also the low jack. Okay. Then you can call it under the gun plus two, under the gun plus one, and then under the gun if you're playing nine handed. Okay, good. All right, so that's that what the low jack is. The low jack is under the gun, six-handed. So if under the gun, six-handed raises, and you're in the big blind, you should be defending using this strategy. Three betting with just some of the best hands, also some bluffs. And in this scenario, the bluffs that you want to three bet with are hands that flop very well because you're going to get called a lot because you're against the low jack's range, right? Which should be quite strong. And then you have a, you know, actually a pretty snug defending range. A lot of people call, like any Queen X suited, any Jack 7 suited, any Ace. And that is a big, big, big mistake. You're going to find that you just have to play tighter and more aggressively when you are playing in a game where your opponents are playing reasonable ranges and there is rake. So you have to play tighter, right? So stop defending your blinds so frequently. 
We see Big Blind versus Button, who it should have a quite wide range, maybe 50% of hands. You see, we still just can't even defend all the Ace X, like Ace 2 offsuit's probably a fold. Now, again, if your opponents are going to be making big mistakes, then that results in you being able to play a wider range, right? Like, let's say you know when you are, your opponent raises, they're going to fold to a re-raise every single time. Unless they have aces and kings and queens. Well, if that's the case, then obviously you should be 3-betting them literally every single hand, right? Are ace-5, ace-4, x or basically are these low bluffs enough to balance your premium 3-bet? So we'll realize when we're 3-betting this entire range, this is essentially a linear 3-betting range, Right? We're 3-betting stuff like Jack-10 suited, and if we get 4-bets or jammed on, we have to fold, right? So this is a linear range. This is very different than a typical, very polarized 3-betting range like um, like this, right? This is much more polarized, where we know when we 3-bet Ace-Jack offsuit, King-Queen offsuit, 10-9 suited, King-9 suited, four, Ace-4 four suited, and get 4-bet, we have to fold these hands. This is very obvious. Over here, it's not quite as obvious, right, which hands are folds. And that de usually depends on your opponent's strategy, obviously. It also depends on your, um, like how your opponent perceives you, and it depends on how big your opponent makes it. As your opponent makes it smaller, you get to defend more often. Are you recommending a 4x initial raise size 3-bet from the big blind? Um, yeah, 3.75x, 4x, something like that. On the shady mobile sites where you have to deal with paying money to people who may be associated with the mafia, on those sites they play 8 or 9-handed. Do the ranges need to be tightened up? Um, no. The low jack is the low jack seat. When they fold to you, that, that, that's, this is what I'm trying to tell you all here. Whenever they fold to you in the low jack seat, which is also under the gun six-handed, that's exactly the same or for all practical purposes effectively the same as nine-handed when they fold you in the low jack seat. You should not think the low jack seat is under the gun nine-handed. That's not what I'm saying, right? You're always counting backwards from the button. For example, say there's, say there's three people at the table. You're on the button. You should be playing roughly the same range, nine-handed on the button when they fold to you, as three-handed when they fold to you on the button. I know there's going to be some people out there who, who want to discuss card removal effects and whatnot. Yes, I realize there are slight differences, but it, it's effectively the same game. So just pretend when you're playing six-handed, like the first three players folded. What about on Poker Stars? There's lots of low-stakes nine-handed games. Sure, but there's way more six-handed. It's very important whenever you are playing poker that you learn games that have a future. And a big, big, big mistake a lot of people make is they try to learn a game that doesn't really run at the medium and high stakes. And that results in them learning strategies that may not work. That results in them learning things that are just completely irrelevant. And I highly suggest all of you look at the games that are running at the high stakes and play those games. And don't play games that are not running at the high stakes, assuming you actually want to make significant money from poker, which I realize a lot of you actually do want to win significant money from poker, which is why I always try to shy you or push you away from things that don't make a whole lot of sense, right? I get I get an email every day saying something to the effect of, oh, or should we, I, I like playing Pot Limit Omaha 8 or better. Uh, do you have any Pot Limit Omaha 8 or better content? The answer is like, no, because very few high stakes Pot Limit Omaha 8 or better games run. And when they do, it's like once a week. So you can't even get in any volume. Why do you want to spend a substantial amount of your time learning a game that doesn't really exist? Unless it's just for fun, right? All right. When playing cash games, you recommend not multi-tabling uh, with other types of games because they play differently. Um, unless you're very, very good at all forms of games, I would suggest you play one specific type of game. Are cash games a good way to build a bankroll? They are perhaps the best way to build a bankroll. Is Jonathan Little actually reading all these questions? Yes. Are there time rate games online? No. Is the low jack always the first to act? No. The low jack is literally this exact seat at the table. It goes big blind, small blind, button, cutoff, hijack, low jack. That's six-handed. If it's nine-handed, it'd be under the gun plus two, under the gun plus one, and under the gun. So uh, low jack is not always first, right? A lot. Of what, what I think this under the gun or first position confuses a lot of people. Because under the gun six-handed is very different than under the gun nine-handed. But the hijack and the low jack, etc., these are more, much more specific names. And I think you should use very specific names because it makes it very clear exactly what we are talking about. Because the low jack is the low jack in all games, right? Are we really talking about the table positions? Well, apparently, Christian, some people don't know that. So we always have to answer the questions of the people who are here. Why is ace-jack offsuit in the button put as a three-bet? Because we're bluffing. We are using a three-betting strategy in this situation 
comprised of a polarized range. The absolute best hands, Jackson better, ace, queen suited, ace, king, with the intention of getting it all in. And then all these other hands are used as bluffs. Okay? So, tip number three. Don't overplay marginal hands post-flop. Let's take a look at a few examples. Here we have pocket aces. We raise it up from the cutoff seat. The big blind calls. Flop comes six, five, three. And the big blind checks. So, this is a situation where you can either bet or check. I think either play is fine. This is certainly a board that should connect very, very well with your opponent in the big blind, right? So this is a spot where we should be checking a decent amount of time, but you know, whatever, betting's fine. We do bet and we get raised. And right off the bat, if you're playing small stakes games, I think that, uh, I'm not gonna tell you you should fold here immediately, but there are many, many situations where, especially if you're playing against players who you know, that they're just not bluffing here. Now, obviously they could be check raising with hands like eight, seven, nine, eight, 9-7, right? Those are some pretty obvious bluffs. Maybe stuff like ace-4, king-4, queen-4. So there actually are a decent number of bluffs available, but realize they could also have a whole lot of uh, straights, sets, two pairs. So this is a spot where you actually should be checking back a decent amount of the time. We did bet, though. We call. Turn is a 7, and the opponent bets again. Now, it's actually a very, very easy fold. So I would easily fold. You may say, why are we folding here? We have aces. Well, think about this, right? If our opponent did have a set, three of a kind, they are they still beat us, and we're drawing nearly dead. If they had a four in their hand, they just improved to a straight, so we're dead. If they had a flush draw, random queen nine of clubs, we lose to that. So we actually lose to every single hand of the opponent's range here. So even though we have a very good bluff catcher in theory, because, you know, good over pairs are usually pretty good bluff catchers. In this situation, we have a very, very easy fold. This player decided to call, though, which is a big mistake. River's a queen. Opponent bets again. Very, very easy fold. Easy fold. But we pay. They generally never have air. They could easily have great equity with a draw or a combination draw. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, a good check-raising range in this spot for the opponent on the flop is premium made hands and draws. And when all the draws get there, you lose. Matthew says, if they have a four, we're not completely dead. You can chop if another four comes. Matthew, you have to realize that we're not speaking in ex extremely precise terms because very often you always have a little bit of equity against lots of stuff, right? But you're effectively dead, right? On 653, when you get check raised by a set, you're not actually dead, but you're effectively dead. And when you refer to the nuts, 653... Pocket fives is the effective nuts, but you can refer to it as the nuts because it's so good to the point that you're not folding. It's very, very important to realize that you cannot be overly nitpicky in these scenarios because then you just end up discussing things that are irrelevant and wasting everyone's time. And we don't want to waste everyone's time because time is the only resource that we cannot really replenish. So anyway, this is a situation where we have a very, very easy fold on the turn. And in this spot, well, here I ended up paying it off on the turn and the river, which is a big mistake. And I see this type of thing happen all the time. All, all, all the time, right? And this is a big, big problem. What if it turns the ace of clubs instead? Well, then we can call because now we have a either the best made hand or a very strong draw, right? To, to the best full house. Can you use heads-up displays online? On some sites, are these tips better used for nine-handed or six-handed? Both games. I think... What you all are not understanding is that nine-handed and six-handed are exactly the same thing. Besides, the first three players fold. Would I recommend these ranges and insert any game? Yes, all of the games. It seems like you all think that there's some broad difference between five no limit and 25 no limit online. And really, the games are pretty much exactly the same. What if the turn was a two, an offsuit two? Well, that would be a very um, different scenario because then we don't lose to the flush draws. But it's still probably just a fold. Because if you think of the draws, a lot of the draws have a four, which we lose to. And uh, we still lose to the sets. And the flush draws, yeah, uh, there's some flush draws available. But I think that's the spot where we probably just need to fold too. If it was a ten of hearts, do we continue? Yeah, we probably continue on exactly ten of hearts. Seems like you play a tight, aggressive style. Well, no, I play the style suggested by the GTO bots. 
you have to realize, like, people say, oh, it seems like you like this. I don't like this necessarily. This isn't what Jonathan Little wants to do. This may not be what Jonathan Little finds the most fun. This is what makes the most money. Right? And the goal that I'm trying to teach, I mean, I'm trying to teach you all with a goal of we are trying to make as much money possible. We're not trying to teach you how to splash around and gamble and have a party with your friends, right? We're trying to teach you how to win money. And that means playing exactly as the strong GTO bots suggest with the idea that you are going to adjust based on whatever your opponents do incorrectly. Okay? Lots of people get married to overpairs. Indeed, indeed. Do you have a book on specifically online six max, low stake cash games? I have a book called Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em that applies to literally all No Limit Hold'em games up to perhaps eh, $5,000 buy-in tournaments and 510 No Limit Online. So yes, I do. Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. It's a nice big book. It will teach you how to crush the games. We have another hand. Let's take a look at this one. Here we open it up with pocket jacks, big blind calls, flop comes queen 5-4. Seems like a very nice spot to either check or bet small. And this is a situation where we should very, very frequently have a checking range that includes hands like our weakest queen x and also our hands like pocket jacks, pocket tens, pocket nines. Because if we bet these and get raised then we really are pretty unhappy. But if we check and it checks behind, we're now in fine shape, right? So this is a fine scenario to go ahead and check with the idea that we're going to be calling down very, very frequently. So check, check, turns a 10, opponent bets two. This is a spot where I think a lot of people, again, make a mistake. They'll raise thinking, oh, I probably have the best hand because the opponent bets small. But recognize that we do not know what the opponent's strategy is. The opponent could just be value betting with a queen, could be value betting with a 10. They could be bluffing with total air, right? We have no way of actually knowing. So we have an easy call with our very clear marginal made hand. Rivers a two, opponent bets six. Again, very, very easy call. At this point, our hand is um, quite, quite strong for our, the hands that are in our range. The opponent could be value betting worse. They could be bluffing with all the busted draws. Notice there's a bunch of diamonds that busted. There's... Um, a lot of straight draws that missed. So this is a very, very, very easy call. We beat a six of diamonds. Um, someone says, don't you want to bet to protect against the diamonds? Well, how do you know they have a diamond, right? We don't know they have a diamond. They could easily have a queen. Do I want to bet to get money in against a queen? No, right? You have to realize you do not know what your opponent has, right? And if you don't know what your opponent has, which clearly you don't, you have to play based on how you want to play each portion of your range. And this is a situation where we have a very clear marginal made hand, as we discussed thoroughly at PokerCoaching.com in the Cash Game Masterclass, which, um, you know, stick around. Maybe I'll give that to all of you for free at the end of this. And very, very easy check, right? So we had this one hand where the aces were drastically overplayed. That is a big, big, big mistake. And then we have this hand where the marginal made hand is played very, very well. And we result in keeping the opponent in with, a, with, with all sorts of bluffs, right? Shouldn't we bet for value and protection on this flop with jacks against a big blind who has a wide range? Well, Sean, you nailed it right here. Big blind has a wide range. Against a wide range, if I bet and the opponent calls, I'm going to be against a whole lot of pairs and draws, which I'm not actually in that great a shape against. But if it goes check, check, they're still in the pot with the whole wide range, which I have loads of equity against. So would I rather play a small pot against a very wide range that I'm crushing or a bigger pot against a tighter range that I'm losing to or you know barely ahead against? You're going to find you would much, much, much rather play a large pot. Well, I'm sorry. Much rather play a small pot that, where you have a large equity advantage. Am I getting these confused? You want to play a small pot with a large equity advantage compared to a big pot with a small or no equity advantage. All right. I see a bunch of you asking me very, very, very irrelevant questions to what we're discussing now. So we will discuss all of this later, perhaps. Lots of times in this scenario, people will make bigger bets on the turn of river because they think that our check is pocket jacks. Our check with jacks and uh, is a check with a flush. Bob, I mean, so look, you're, you're basically saying the opponents are going to think things about your tendencies. Well, then adjust, right? If you know, or if your opponents have announced how exactly they play, then life is easy. Just play to maximally exploit them, right? I am playing here against online players who I have no clue what they're doing. Besides, they're probably trying their best to play good poker and try to win money, right? 
and I'm not going to presume that I know what their general tendencies are. So if you get raised in these situations, is it time to fold? Michael, take a look at this hand. We could literally never get raised. We can't get raised. It's impossible, right? Opponent checks flop. We check behind. They bet the turn. We call. They cannot raise us here. They bet the river. We call. They cannot raise us here. So we literally can never get raised, which is the power of checking behind the flop in these spots because it makes it to where you never get blown off your hand that has strong equity. If we have aces, king, aces or kings, do we bet this flop? Yes, we bet the flop with our best made hands. We discussed this thoroughly in the Cash Game Masterclass. We bet with our best made hands and our draws in basically all scenarios. All right, tip number four. Bet thinly for value, but overfold when you get raised, okay? So even in the middle stakes games, most players do not raise the river nearly often enough. To, so to combat this, you should actually be betting fairly thinly and then you should fold when they raise you. Okay, so let's take a look at an example here. Here we have ace jack. We raise it up, big blind calls. Opponent checks, is this one of our best made hands? Take a second, think about it. Obviously the answer is yes, right? So this is a situation where we want to be betting very, very frequently, right? So we're gonna be betting this hand using a medium to big size because this board connects decently well with a big blind. This is a spot where we do not necessarily want to be betting with all of our hands, right? If we have pocket tens here, we probably don't want to bet, right? So this is a spot where we just bet with our best made hands and our draws. We bet and we get called, okay? Turns the king, opponent checks. Here we can check or bet. I think either play is reasonable. It's kind of unlikely our opponent has a king. Um, so either checking or continuing to bet using like medium-ish size seems fine to me. Goes check, check though. On the river, river four, the opponent checks. And now this is a spot where we have the best hand basically every time. Uh, because the opponent would probably bet if they had a straight on the river. And if they had a king, they'd probably bet. So this is a spot where we pretty much have the green light to go for a small to medium value bet. Whenever you are value betting in this scenario, to some extent, when you're not playing against the absolute best players in the world, you're going to want to just ask, what am I trying to get called by? And we are trying to get called by an eight or a six. So if we're going to bet, we can't go too big. So we here we bet 12, into a 1250 pot, we bet 750. I think this might even be a little bit too big. I think something like $5 is probably a little bit better. But whatever. We do get called and um, we beat Jack seven. So fantastic, right? If we bet the turn, are we turning our hand into a bluff? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. You're telling me if you think someone's sitting here like 870, you think they're just going to fold on the turn if you bet medium? I mean, they're probably not. I mean, the king's a great bluff card in general, right? Not for our hand. We're not turning our hand into a bluff because our hand has a lot of value. When you say turning a hand into a bluff, you're essentially saying no worse hands will call me. But if the opponent ha does have a hand like queen jack, they're obviously going to call on the turn or jack 10 or jack 9 or jack 7, right? So no, if we bet the turn, we're not turning it into a bluff. We are betting it for value because we can get called by worse. Would you be leaving value using a smaller bet size in these scenarios? Um, it depends. You should experiment with that, right? I mean, obviously in this scenario, when the opponent does have exactly the jack seven, we'd rather bet bigger because we just get more money in the pot. But um, I think in general, smaller bet size is probably ideal here because most people are going to fold out an eight or a six to a bigger bet, like a pot size bet, whereas they may call a slightly smaller bet. When the big blind calls preflop, what kind of range do we put him on? Well, we put him on a range based on the charts over at PokerCoaching.com. They are all there for you in the tool section. Go there, look at them. If we did get raised on that river, by the way, we would fold. And that would be that. If we had Jack-7 suited in our opponent's shoes and got double-barreled, would we fold? No, we should definitely not fold. King's a great bluff card. If the opponent has ace-10, they're going to bluff. If they have queen-10, they're going to bluff. If they have queen-9 suited, they're going to bluff. If they have 10-9, uh, ten, ten, they're going to bluff. So no, this is, it would be way too tight to fold that hand there. Unless, of course, your opponents are very, very nitty. All right, tip number five, very important, perhaps the most important one. You need to study constantly. You need to keep track of your hands and review your hands. I do know on some sites they don't allow any sort of tracking programs, which is a bummer, but you should still be recording your hands, especially your difficult ones, and discussing them with your poker playing peers. At pokercoaching.com, we have a forum and a Discord channel where you can go through and ask 
hands, hand questions, and any any kind of poker questions, to people who are very, very strong players. I have taken many players from being losing poker players to winning significant money, life-changing money. I mean, off the top of my head, I can think of four or five guys who I've taken from being break-even poker players just nine months ago to now they're making $50 an hour in live poker back when that was running. And we have many, many world-class online players there. So they are all there for you. Happy to help you become good at the game. Take diligent notes. Write them down. I have a video at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash notes. That shows exactly how I write down hands whenever I'm playing live poker, and it works equally well for online poker. Um, Next, you want to make sure you keep a strong mindset and improve a small amount after every session. If you just play and then you shut your computer and you have a beer and pass out, well, you're not going to get a whole lot better at poker. But if you play and then study your session, that will be way, way, way more beneficial, right? You want to make sure you are actively studying to make sure that you know how to improve in your next session. So that's it. Those are the five tips. I see that a lot of you have asked these random questions that don't apply at all to what we're discussing. So I'll discuss those in just a minute. Let me review these tips and then give you a free gift because, you know, I'm feeling generous now. So five tips to crush online cash games. Number one, play aggressively preflop. Get it out of your mind that you're supposed to be flat calling a lot because you're not. Tip number two, stop defending your big blind so often, especially as your opponents use bigger raise sizes. Tip number three, don't overplay marginal made hands post-flop. Tip number four, value bet thinly, but then overfold when they happen to raise you. And tip number five, study constantly. So I know um, a lot of you have been pushed to online poker because we have a virus going around, and I know you have a lot of free time. So until March 31st, 2020, we will be giving you complete access to Poker Coaching Premium. Literally, all of the best projects, products, et cetera, that I have made since I've started making poker educational content, is available there for you. It's there, completely for free. Don't know what else you want from me. All these charts that I've referenced, those are all there. The Cash Game Masterclass that I suggest all of you go through to get good at poker, it's all there. We have loads and loads of quizzes, right? We have, I think, over 750 quizzes or so. That is all there, right? Right? We have over 800 interactive quizzes, over 130 video classes, 45 challenge webinars, seven coaching webinars, and all that's available to you. If you're already a poker coaching member, that you automatically get it until the end of the month. Every person who wants access to the site, all you have to do is go there, sign up, and log in. We actually have a few webinars coming up. I think these dates might be slightly adjusted because everyone's life is hectic at the moment. But I do know later today... We have a hand history review webinar with Matt Affleck. That's at um, 7 p.m. Eastern time. So in, what, an hour and a half. So you go and sign up there, you get it. Also, we have common flop mistakes with Jonathan Jaffe, who is perhaps the best exploitative player in the world. If you've ever played with him, he is a beast. That will be on Friday, I believe. And then also, Michael Acevedo, the GTO expert. He helped me get together all of these ranges using Munker Solver. Took him years to solve this and get all of this exactly right. Um, He's going to be doing a webinar on flop check raise strategy. I think his webinar is actually on Friday too. So I think we have two webinars on Friday. They'll be at different times. I'm not exactly sure. Log into the site. You will see. So the way you claim this, the way you get free access, sign up to a free account at pokercoaching.com. Just go there right now. Sign up. You can go to pokercoaching.com slash free access. Then log into your account and you'll just automatically have access to the entire site. That's all you have to do. Go there. Get it. I realize that life has uh, thrown a lot of us a curveball. I tried to think, how can I help out all of you? And well, you know, seems like giving away the stuff I have is a nice way to do that. So if you all like online poker, if you like um, cash games, definitely check out the Cash Game Masterclass. That is going to do a lot to help you get better at cash games and be able to crush your opponents. So spend some time between now and the end of the month going through all of that. That is going to make you significantly better at poker. If you already are a Poker Coaching member, again, if you're uh, not a premium member, you get upgraded automatically until the end of the month. All right, let's see. It seems like uh, you're not going to sleep between now and the end of the month. Well, there you go. Good. 
If you have a standard subscription, you don't have to do anything. That is correct. Just log in. Literally go to the site and log in right now. It'll tell you at the top of the page that you've been upgraded. All right, let's take a look at some of your questions. If your game is full of calling stations, should you be using th uh, linear ranges instead of polarized? Um, yeah, in general. Um, and you should probably call the wider range as well because your opponents aren't going to 3-bet you as often. The thing about the fundamentally sound ranges is that you... It presumes your opponents play well. And if your opponents have big blunders in their game, then you get to adjust accordingly. So if your opponents don't 3-bet you pre-flop, you get to start flat calling with a much wider range because the only real bad thing that can happen when you flat with a marginal hand is you can get 3-bet. So if they're not going to 3-bet you, then clearly that's great. Where can you buy my books online? Go to dnbpoker.com. When will various class be released? At some point in the future. I've had a big roadblock put up where I used to have someone taking care of my kids during the day, and now I don't have anyone taking care of my kids during the day. So uh, my wife has a job. She is a senior vice president of tax, so she, she has a legitimate job that she needs to do. And, um, well, that, that's resulted in me not having nearly as much time to record content. But we are, we are doing our best to get it done. Let's see. Does all of this apply to fast-forward Zoom tables, etc.? Yes, poker is poker. The only difference between those games and re regular games is that the players are way better. Again, because you play more hands. As you've played more hands, people get better and the bad players lose. Any tips for maximizing number of tables you can play? Get practice. Move down to the small stakes games and play them a ton. Play tiny stakes, right? And then realize you're not playing to win money. Realize you're playing to get good at making decisions quickly. So if you normally play two tables, move down to tiny stakes games and play four tables for four hours and realize that's just what poker is from now on. And then you can maybe play three, no problem at the high, at your regular game. So you're playing the opposite strategy of your opponents. Not necessarily. You're playing the strategy that maximally exploits them, which is different. What site should a first-time player join? PokerCoaching.com and study a ton. The Cash Game Masterclass is where you need to be right now. What do we think of various poker apps? I mean, look, we've already discussed this a ton, Bob. I'm not going to do it again and again and again. Go to youtube.com slash poker coaching. Watch the webinar we just did with my lawyer, Mac Verstandig. We go through the legality of all the various sites. We go through which ones we would recommend playing if we had to recommend one of those horribly bad options. Um, you know, it's like you go to a restaurant and they offer you four really bad plates of food. You pick the plate that is the least bad, or ideally, you don't play at all because you don't have to play. Realize that you do not have to play on the really bad sites, and if you do, you don't have to put all of your money into it and um, you know, open yourself up to losing loads and loads of money or getting screwed in some way. Would you consider doing content on, on small stakes online tournaments? Have you not been to PokerCoaching.com? Go to PokerCoaching.com, sign in. We have content on all sorts of content or also all sorts of games so definitely check that out you meant join to play play on the licensed regulated sites party poker is great poker stars is great those are sites that are never going to screw you and um you'll be fine can you tell what online cash games to play if you normally play 2-2 or 2-4 no limit live games i would tell you to play tiny stakes get some experience realize that your job is not necessarily to make money at the moment, your goal is to get experience. Greg asked another similar question. What's a good game to make side income? Well, find a game that you can beat, right? I mean, if you're asking me this question, I presume that you are not already a good, strong, winning player because you don't even know where to go to make money. So you need to start at the tiny stakes and work your way up. Take it slow. I have a article called The Bankroll Bible. Go there, read it. It is at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. Again, everyone asking about various online sites please, please, please go to youtube.com slash poker coaching and watch that. Also, you can go to Jonathan Little, or you, yeah, what is it? JonathanLittlePoker.com slash USA. I made a video outlining my thoughts on the various online sites and all those thoughts still apply. John said, you want to thank you for the free upgrade. You're welcome. You have till the end of the month to make use of it. John, I have no clue what you're asking. What do you consider too much rake? That's a difficult question because it depends on are you winning or not in the games, right? For example, if your opponents are really bad, you can actually beat rake that's very, very high. But if your opponents are all really good, you can't beat any rake. 
I mean, this is what has happened in the very, very high stakes games where no one actually wins. They all lose the rake because everybody's really, really good. So how much is too much? It depends on the game. Whenever you're asking questions, always try to ask questions from the point of view of, am I missing something very obvious? Always ask, is there something very obvious I'm missing, right? With rake, for example, what actually determines your win rate? Well, the rake and, and your opponent's strategies, their loss rate, right? So if the rake is less than your opponent's loss rate, you can still win. How does rake work online? Same way as it does live, right? You you play a pot, they take they take some um, take some money out of the pot. If you compare online to live, which is similar to two two live, um, I don't know, five cent, ten cent online, something like that. Preflop if you're on the border of a call or raise with a decent hand, should you default to raise? Um, that's a tough one. I would tell you it depends on your game, right? If your opponents are playing generally tight strategies, you should probably lean towards calling more often because you don't really want to three bet against tight ranges, right? But if your opponents are playing wide ranges, then you should perhaps be more inclined to three bet. So it definitely depends. If you play on a site that has an auto straddle and an ante, would that change your strategy? Well, you definitely have to play wider ranges, right? Because there's more money in the pot. It bothers you that when sites rake a lot, they make more money than you make. Well, who, why do you think you're entitled to make money from poker? Something a lot of people don't quite understand is that you are not actually entitled to anything in this game. To win money from any game, you have to work very, very hard. And you certainly are not owed anything by a company that has set up shop to try to run a poker game. It's actually very, very nice that the online poker sites allow you to make money. You see what PokerStars is doing, right? No one wins on PokerStars, or very few people are winning on PokerStars because they've jacked up the rake. Why? Because they don't actually care if you win any money. So recognize that you certainly are not owed anything from poker sites. So find games that you can beat, find games that have a future, and play them. I mean, I used to be one of the best sit-and-go players in the world, and then, um, well, a few bad things happen to the point that sit and goes are no longer profitable at the high stakes. So what do I do? Do I just like quit playing poker? No, you pivot, you adjust, you learn to do other things. And you learn to find the games that are still very beatable. Like, well, medium stakes and high stakes tournaments. Still very beatable, right? They're just been getting a bit greedy. Well, again, this is all from your point of view, Michael. You have to realize that your point of view is not the only one. You have to realize that companies goals are not to appease poker players who want to make money. Their goal is to make money. And they can go about that in various ways. That said, I'm very glad with that sites like Party Poker are still working to keep the game beatable and fun. What about the idea of long ball versus small ball? I know I think you should just play fundamentally sound. Learn to play well and get all these thoughts out of your mind like, ooh, I should try to change gears here. Because no, all of that is asinine when you learn to just play fundamentally sound. Why are high stakes sit and goes no longer profitable? Well, there's the rake is too high is essentially the answer. No one has an edge because the game is easy. Sit and goes are easy games. So given the game is very simple, the edges in general will be small. Also, the games are very fast, so the edges will be very small. So edges are small to begin with. And then if they're going to rake 5, 5% or 10%, you're not going to have a 5% ROI or 10% ROI against good players. So there you go. That's why the games aren't beatable. Again, learn games with a future. It's highly important if you want to have a future. Oh, uh, let's see. What do I, do I think World Series is going to be canceled? I think it'll probably be postponed in one way or another. If you're on a bad run, what should you do? Ask yourself if you're a losing player or if you are actually just running bad. If you're just running bad, then it doesn't matter. Regarding my video to online poker, you're referring to the one with Mac for Standig. Yes, Bob. Also, you can go to jonathanlowpoker.com slash USA to see a video I made, I don't know, maybe six months ago about the various online sites. It was actually funny. A few um, people who were shills for some of those sites came out of the woodwork and started trying to uh, talk trash and say that I was wrong. And it turns out a lot of those people are, yeah, uh, an interesting group. Let's just say that. So anyway, be careful. Realize that a lot of people who are trying to promote various shady sites are doing it because they are getting paid. I'm not getting paid by anyone besides you. Some of you don't even pay me and I'm still out here helping you. And my job is to make sure that 
you are as protected as you can possibly be. Please, please, please do not listen to people who are paid by a site to tell you that a site is good. That is perhaps the worst thing you can do in poker, business, life, etc. Listen to people who don't actually make money from things like that, right? Got to be smart. You got to be smart. A lot of people don't want to be smart, though. They just want to gamble. You're playing 5 no limit with a win rate of 5.51 big blinds per 100. Is that enough to move up? Um, I mean, you can try. I mean, you might find that you have the same win rate because rake will be a little bit less. Do you still tilt? Not really. I, I'm pretty much immune to caring about things that don't matter. Should you play on party poker or poker stars for online cash games? Um, pretending, like, the question is exactly about which one has more or less rake. I don't know which one has more or less rake. Go there and look it up. I do know that it's thought that party poker games are a little bit softer, which is going to lead to a higher win rate in general. So an average VP range for cash games that you can impart to you. Um, go download the charts at pokercoaching.com. Go there. Look at the screen. Go to pokercoaching.com slash free access. Go to the tool section. And get the charts. Get the preflop 6 max GTO charts. It's exactly what you need. How many hands before you know um, your win rate? You'll never actually know your win rate. It's more a question of um, how, how accurately do you want to know your win rate, right? How do you replenish your bankroll? Well, ideally, you don't lose your bankroll. Do you put winnings in your bankroll until you fill it up before, before expenses? I mean, this, this is a weird question, right? Do you put a percentage of your winnings into your bankroll? 100% of your winnings should go into your bankroll. Until you have a substantial, substantial bankroll, I would tell you to never cash out anything. A great way to not move up in stakes is to take the money out and spend it on stuff. I mean, I, I was very fortunate to see this when I was young. I, me and another guy I was friends with used to play poker. We were both probably the two, only two winning players in a game. Every time we would win, we'd win like 20 bucks. It was small stakes games. The my friend would go out and buy a new CD, you know, to listen to music. I would take the money and save it. After about a year of this, I had a nice pot of money. He had a bunch of used CDs. And I don't think he made it in poker. I don't think he made it even uh, to the medium stakes. But he was happy. He had a bunch of CDs. He was cool, right? Um, but he never really made much out of his life. And that that the, the idea that a lot of people have is that you're supposed to spend the money that you have. But money in poker is a tool, and it is actually the lifeblood of a poker player. If you do not have a bankroll, you don't get to play. So the number one thing you should be doing is building a bankroll. Realize, a lot of people get into poker because they think, I'm going to get into poker and I'm going to get rich. I'm going to make some money. But, that, but they don't actually realize that you actually get rich off of poker by not spending your money and not really get, losing it in, in various silly ways by, you know, buying fancy dinners or a fancy car or music CDs or whatever, right? If you have no money and you have no money in your bankroll, um, you, you have to get it somehow. So the way you do that is by taking money from your job, right? You have to realize when you're playing Tiny Stakes online, you're going to be making like a dollar an hour if you're good, right? You're not making a ton of money from Tiny Stakes games. But that is a good way to grow it naturally and actually prove to yourself that you are a winning player. Once you know you are a winning player, that's when you can start moving up a little bit more aggressively. Should you avoid playing tournaments and cash games at the same time? If you are not already a world-class cash game player and a world-class tournament player, you should definitely not play them at the same time. You should focus on one game, in my opinion, until you get very good at it. Just make sure you pick the game that makes logical sense for you to focus on, right? Like, say you know you have to work every day, seven days a week, for six hours or eight hours. Well, then tournaments probably don't work for you, right? Because you, you may have longer tournaments that screw up your job. If you know that you can play for two hours at a time each day, well, then cash games are great. And that's actually the situation most people are in, which is why we're doing this presentation today. Are most players using GTO solvers online? At the high stakes, definitely yes. At the small stakes, definitely no. How many games should you play online at a time? If you're learning, probably like four at the most. I mean, you should start adding more tables as you become a strong winning player. But ideally, realize again, if you're not playing already like medium to high stakes, your goal should not be to win money. Your goal should be to get good at poker so that you can move up and then win tons of money, right? You have to, you have to be a little bit, um, you have to love delayed gratification. Michael asked a question that's not great. What's the ratio of winning sessions to losing sessions for winning players? It depends, right? 
How long are the sessions? Realize that winning sessions and losing sessions doesn't actually matter. What matters is winning money in every individual hand that you play. For example, if I play a... If every day I play 12 hours online, I'm probably not going to have actually all that many losing sessions. But I don't want to sit there tethered to my computer for 12 hours straight. That's not fun for me. So I'll play two-hour sessions. And you're going to have losing sessions when you play two-hour sessions. If you, blo if you break it up in various chunks, right, you're going to have losing sessions, and that's okay. Losing does not, losing sessions should not matter to you. Should you have a different bankroll for cash or tournaments? I'm assuming you're not a winning, if you're not sure of your win rate in various games, probably. Should you move up once you have 25 big blinds for the next level? If you want to be very aggressive, perhaps. Are you only taking questions from certain people? No, I'm answering lots of the questions as they come in. Unfortunately, I had about 150 questions. So, um, you know, if I haven't gotten to your question yet, be patient. Believe it or not, I'm actually going as fast as I can to answer these questions. And, you know, if you ask a question that's already been asked, I may not very specifically ask yours. Do you have any advice for hyper-turbo tournaments? Realize hyper-turbo tournaments are very similar to regular tournaments, and there's no difference, right? You're just playing shallow stacked. Do we have shallow stack charts at PokerCoaching.com? Why don't you go sign up to PokerCoaching.com slash free access right now, go to the tool section, Go to the 15 big blind implementable GTO charts and download those. Go to the 25 big blind implementable charts and download those. Go to the 40 big blind implementable charts and download those. And there you go. There you have it. And you'll have them just for you, completely for free. You feel like certain players always make the right play against you. Should you stay away from them? I mean, why are they making the right play against you? They're always hero calling you correctly. They're always hero folding correctly, etc. Um, it's probably just short-term variants, really. Is the 30-day challenge still available? Uh, I don't know. Send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com. What is the buy-in from small to medium stakes? Realize that, that that's very, very loose because, like, some tournaments are especially soft. Every Sunday, for example, the tournaments are way softer than, like, say, a random Thursday, right? So recognize that um, mid-stakes to high-stakes is not really a great phrase or term but i mean you can still make good money at like 200 dollar buy-in tournaments no problem so you know call it what you want to call it are the charts printable i don't know i haven't tried printing them would you recommend the ratio of playing time versus studying if you're already not a strong player you should be spending most of your time studying right because if you're not a winning player why are you sitting there playing all the time right you're just losing your money. Do you want to sit there and lose your money? Or would you rather sit there and better your skills so that you can get good at poker, right? The goal is to get good at poker. Yes, you can print the charts. Good. There you go. What's my view on pushing all in on the flop when you're first to act with a potential straight or flush draw, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, this depends mainly on stack depth, right? As stacks are shallower, you should be more inclined to make all-in bets. Um, that said, the problem with jamming with exactly one specific type of hand even if it does have a decent amount of equity is that if your opponents ever figure that out they're just going to crush you but i mean if you're jamming with hands that have 42 percent equity it's probably just fine but you have to ask what does that do to the rest of my range right now whenever you bet small your range becomes just like a whole lot of premium made hands and marginal made hands which changes things substantially so it allows your opponents to play better against the rest of your range you have any videos that shows you how to study well, for example, today, Matt Affleck, one of our fantastic coaches at Poker Coaching, is going to be reviewing a student's hand history review. I have no clue what hand history he's reviewing. I don't know even what he's going to be talking about, but I can tell you if you go there, he's going to show you how he studies poker. So go there, 7 p.m. today. You have free access. Go to pokercoaching.com slash free access to get it. Is 100 binds enough of a bankroll? Well, it depends on your win rate, right? If you have um, a, a high win rate, you don't need anywhere near that much. If you have a tiny win rate, you need more. Realize that the idea of I need X amount of money to play a specific game does not make sense because it depends on your win rate. And in tournaments, it also depends on the number of people in the tournament and the payout structures of the tournaments that you are playing, right? So it's, it's not just a simple question of I need X amount of buy-ins. So go to jonathanlittlepoker.com bankroll and read that. 
What's the normal winning average for building your bank? I mean, again, all these people ask me like winning averages and stuff. None of that really matters. You're going to have big wins. You're going to have big losses. And that is standard. Get used to it and embrace it. Love it. Can playing against bots improve your game? I guess referring to things like Poker Snowy, I definitely think playing against programs like Poker Snowy will benefit your game. I have some videos on YouTube. Uh, search YouTube for Jonathan Little Poker Snowy. You'll see me playing against it and finding some interesting spots that maybe I was playing a little bit incorrectly. And to be fair, it actually uses ranges very similar to what Monker Solver solved for. And, you know, that's good to know, right? It can also simulate games with rake, games without rake, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So... I do think that's a good program to try. Go to jonathanlittle.com slash pokersnowy. I think you get some sort of sign-up bonus if you use that. You've seen lots of pot-sized bets with draws lately. How would you play those? Um, I mean, you're supposed to be betting big with your best-made hands in your draws. There you go. The more you learn, the less you know. Indeed, that's how it works. Where can you find the charts to print out? In the tool section at pokercoaching.com, go to pokercoaching.com slash free access, sign up, go to the tool section on the left-hand side. There's all sorts of tools there, including preflop charts. Uh, let's see. Am I worried about bots taking over online poker? Um, no, not really. Although, hey, you know, bots will be able to beat humans eventually. Fortunately, right now, a lot of the bots take forever, and they're not really very good, and they're easy to spot, so that's good. If you already are a Poker Coaching member, do you, do, do you need to do anything to make premium worth? No, just log right in. You're good to go. Is there a chart that has preflop hand equity? No, because your equity depends on your opponent's ranges and whatnot. I suppose when they fold you, you could somehow figure out how much every single hand wins at that point. Kind of like... Um, Hold'em resources calculator does, but that's not really useful for just a generic preflop range chart. How can you spot a bot? Honestly, I'm not the person to ask about this because I don't play on shady sites that allow bots, right? There are a few well-known sites in America that like welcome bots, and um, I just don't play on those sites. I, I never would. I would never give them business. I have more respect for myself and for the game of poker than to frequent those places. Um... I definitely suggest, I mean, this is just another reason why I suggest you play on licensed, legal, regulated sites as opposed to those who are either blatantly illegal or skirting the law. Because you have to worry about that stuff. Because often they don't have resources of a publicly traded company to make sure their games are legit and on the up and up. So it's tough. It's tough out there if you decide to get involved with illegal companies. You know, play at your own risk. All right, so that's going to be it for today. I did get through all of the questions. Unless you left, if you left, it said you left, and then, well, maybe I didn't answer your question. But until the end of March, I'm doing my best to help all of you make the most of this time where you all may be locked down at home. Um, so go to pokercoaching.com slash free access. You have access to everything I have between now and the end of March. Hope you enjoy it. Hope you learn a ton. If you do, let me know on Twitter. Tell your friends. Maybe they'll learn something too. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Thanks for being here. And I'll talk to you next time.